Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Derek Gonzalez. I am the product manager for PyVDC at Pinnacle Infotech. Uh, today, we are going to be having our second, uh, I guess you would say, episode or series uh, from the Pinnacle Infotech BIM series. Uh, today, we are going to be going over the impact of automation in the VDC industry. Um, with me today, I have Travis Voss, Nauman Patoir, Andrew Ludden. Uh, some of our panelists here today will give a brief introduction later on. Um, now, for our slides here, it is going to be nice, brief. I know nobody really likes a long slideshow, so I'll start getting into it. Like I said, we are going to be talking today about the impact of automation in the VDC industry. Now, whenever you talk about automation in the VDC industry, it could mean a number of things. So my first topic is what is automation so depending on where you're at what you're going to be doing it could be anything from payroll uh, to me i am a terrible writer so i use grammarly uh, it could be something as simple as that just spell check uh, depending on those individuals or the company that automation could cover a wide range of tasks you see here now, one of the key points for automation is it's just basically taking a task or two and automating it. Um, like I said, spell check. I don't have to go through every word. It pops it up for me. It could go as far as you can see in this image here. Some of our sleeves, uh, automatically placing sleeves. Um, I got to hear Andrew kind of talk about that right whenever we were joining this call. So really just helping out with some of those tasks here and there and really just speeding things up, uh, taking out that user error and helping out overall increasing speeds. Now I will let Naman go over Pinnacle's uses of our automation. Uh, thank you, Derek. So uh, Pinnacle, we have a large global workforce and because of that, we've seen automation usage across variety of uh, use cases. But they would mainly fall into two buckets, VDC modeling and project execution. So for VDC modeling, as Derek was talking about sleeve placement, that's an example, but it can also, it can also range over to something like preparing Kobe sheets for asset handover as well. And the other one for project execution, because we're already familiar that any company has multiple departments that have dependencies on each other. So how do we digitize the workflow between these departments so at any given time, you can get the accurate project status. Uh, during this seminar, uh, we'll be touching base a little bit on uh, how Pinnacle works on some of some of these. Uh, you know, we'll just see how we'll just see how the panel goes. And yeah, uh, that's all from my side, Derek. Definitely, and, and I'll touch a little bit on that as well. Is Pinnacle's use of automation? Um, we are large enough that we also see a lot of the pains that the industry is seen as well so we're really having to work hand in hand with our developers and everything and find just the smallest task to help out with that automation could be even switching a file name something similar to that now kind of talking about the industry we do have some experts here to kind of introduce themselves as well so i'm going to stop that slideshow right here and i'm going to go ahead and let travis voss uh you want to go ahead and give yourself a brief introduction there Sure. Uh, I'm Travis Voss. I work for Helm Mechanical here in Northern Illinois. Um, we are very heavily MEP contractor in the Midwest, but we do projects coast to coast, uh, depending on project type. Um, I've been in the industry going on or about to be my seventh year now. I'm actually I come out of uh, the development world, but uh, new to construction. Or I, I guess I can't say new to construction. I'm still trying to get get away with that that line, but uh, I'm not allowed to say it in some <laughs> some cases. So uh, yeah, that's me. Oh, uh, also, I should probably mention I am one of the co-hosts of the Construction Dorkcast. I should probably put that out there, too. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right. Thank you, Travis. Uh, Andrew, if you want to go ahead and give your intro there. Yeah, my name is Andrew Lutton. I work for SJS Mechanical here in the Seattle, Washington. We're a smaller plumbing contractor focused just on plumbing new construction multifamily assisted living um, i've been in the industry as an operations manager for the last four years and 
help kind of build up to where we are now, where we've just started in the last three or four years, focusing on modeling and having a fab shop up and going, getting that fully implemented. And Naman, if you want to give your introduction there. Sure. Um, so my name is Naman. I work at Pinnacle's Research and Development Department. Uh, I'm a software engineer by trade. Uh, recently, it switched to construction. And yeah, like I'm here to kind of understand. I, I really strongly believe that automation now really requires a context. And from my from my time as a software engineer in an e-commerce play, I realized that you know e-commerce was kind of done, and construction just had so many interesting problems to solve. So I was like, okay, time to change my context, get into construction, and see where we can go from there. Awesome, thank you, sir. And I guess I will give a quick little little bit more in depth there. Uh, my name is Derek Gonzalez, uh, the PM, like I was saying there. Uh, for me, I have been, I guess, officially back in the industry for, I think, five or six years. Uh, I grew up in a family plumbing business. Um, it was very manual, pen, paper, very boring to me. I uh, got out of it, graduated college, and then I saw somebody using Fabrication uh, Academy P, and I said, whoa, technology is in construction now? What's going on here? Um, that's what I, I was looking for, and now I'm back in it uh, more on the development side so kind of a little opposite of the direction travis went there um <laughs> but no to kind of get into some of our panel questions here so what i'll start off with is what do you consider automation in your context so Naman, let's go ahead and i'll start off with you you want to answer that there um sure um for me i i think automation is any workflow that can affect a certain process be it like increasing the throughput of a process or improving the quality of that process. Um, and then the process scope can be super big or super small, it really depends on the context. And you know, even if you open up a big problem, it's generally co comprised of small problems. So that's how we look at kind of automation. Definitely, definitely. And, and that kind of goes off of my thought of it as well. Uh, you said a big task and two small little tasks. Um, for me, I always see automation as all those little tasks just need to be solved right away. So I consider automation as simple as, like I was saying earlier, spell check. But now that I'm back into the construction world, seeing spool sheet creation, I, I want that automatically being tagged. Let's Let's develop something for that. So basically just taking a task that you're doing manually and automating it, even if it's just taking out one step, two step, it doesn't have to be some grand scheme of thing. Um, Travis, Andrew, what are your feelings on that? Uh, yeah, I would say, you know, for my context as a, as a construction technologist in in a you know a, a fairly large MEP contractor, um, my you know, automation for me, you know goes goes kind of across the breadth like it, it can be anything to like you're saying you know uh, some word processing stuff um, some tools we're trying to use in BIM and through our fabrication process all the way out to you know trying some layout layout robots and and whatnot so um, I, I completely agree with you Derek and, and I'm gonna, it's finding I like to use mundane as the word it's finding those mundane repetitive tasks um, you know we're we all know the various reasons for this i'm sure we'll get into more but nobody wants to send spend their day just copying and pasting stuff in from one cell to another or one one server to another so looking for opportunities there where where we can um, offload some of that work to whatever automation process that is um is is kind of is a lot of the stuff i focus on gotcha and andrew um your point of views on them uh how are you feeling about automation now yeah, automation to me, I agree with everything you guys just said when you get into the details of spool sheets and you're making annotations and you got to push them around on every spreadsheet. I think that that's one big chunk of automation that is still a lot of room for improvement in the industry. The other half of automation to me and what we've seen in the last couple of years, automation means standardization to me. And that's mm -hmm. that's the same sort of efficiency of moving a moving an annotation around to getting our guys to be doing the same thing or seeing the same thing every time it comes up to them. 
No, I love that point. That's something that we often overlook that that you can automate a really crappy process and get horrible, horrible results. But if you <laughs> if you standardize and you create a structure um, that that makes it a lot easier. I love that point. I love I, I, I love talking standardization and it usually doesn't go anywhere because people hate to be standardized, but um, it, it's one of my <laughs> uh, passions. Uh, so just going off on that, how do you guys make that trade off? You know, of like, you know, something, a new, someone tells you to automate a certain process and it's just a deviation of a current automation that might exist for a process. Then that trade off becomes really hard where, like, hey, I'm going to start something from scratch or kind of, you know, tell the guy to do it manually. Um, I've really struggled with that trade off in the past. I'd love to take that one because that standardization piece to me, it comes back to, all right, what material or brand of fitting are we going to be using in the field? That all starts in the field for me. And from my seat, it's taking what is the most efficient and economical in the field and then kind of backtracking that through our process to how do we standardize how we're going to get that one thing standardized out in the field? How do we build the process? How do we use automation to get that across all projects? Yeah, and I think from my end, what I what I end up doing is every, I think you've probably all heard the the lean process and whatever, and get down to the five whys. You know, um, you know, taking maybe opposing views of of people that want you know, let's say an install drawing annotated a certain way, and it's completely different than this other job. So if you really bash down to the five whys, you can kind of get down to this is the this is the standard information that you need, um, and let's just focus mm -hmm. there. You know, and 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 kind because of, you can usually. If you ask why enough, you can explain away some of the kind of the uh, extraneous stuff around the edges. Oh, the, I understand where you're coming from. Sorry. No, that that's that is one of my favorite questions. Is why it, it <laughs> really starts drilling down onto the exact need of why you're doing it that way. Um, so I, I completely agree with you there, Travis. Awesome, awesome. So I guess. Kind of going off of that, uh, we can look at specific examples how automation has affected you personally, um, could be personal or in the workforce. Um, so for me, I, like I said, I'm a terrible, terrible writer. Um, I, I'm going to kind of go off of something that Naman mentioned yesterday, but chat GTP, I think that's the correct wording <laughs> letters for it. Uh, that and Grammarly uh, together are definitely kind of saving me. Um, I failed English class multiple times, I'll admit it. So I I'm glad to have those spell checks and everything uh, there to help me. And to me, that chat GTP, it's kind of at least giving me a starting point that I can go through and start, okay, this is kind of where I needed it to go. Now let me kind of flush out that idea more. So those are some examples of how it's been affecting me. Um, now, whenever it comes to the VDC industry, uh, Andrew, you kind of mentioned it earlier, but hangers as well. It, it's it's one of those most boring tasks, just place, copy, move down, measure. Just having something to automatically place them down a whole run. Uh, that that to me is just one of the biggest time savers and also allows for more projects to be completed at a faster rate. So th those are some little examples from my end. Uh, Nam and I know with uh, some of the projects that we've been getting uh, on the client desk and everything, what are some examples you got there? Um, uh, so uh, uh, definitely one example I'd like to highlight is, again, chat GPT that you brought up. Uh, you know, like how there is this meme going around, this pretty common meme that says, uh, a software engineer spends 10 hours automating a 10 hour work and writing a script to automate that, where he could just spend those 10 minutes and get that done. And it's not that much frequent of a, of a work. Well, ChatGPT is kind of reducing that 10-hour timeline where I can just tell ChatGPT to write me a script um, to do that 10-minute job rather than me spending 10 hours to create that script. So that has been affecting me personally this last week. So it has been pretty awesome. Um, but, you know, it, uh, definitely overall, um, how it has been helping is, you know, like I come, I come from the days when you had to manually deploy a bunch of infrastructure on cloud platforms by clicking buttons it was very easy to kind of misclick some buttons or forget some security settings. And how now you have infrastructure as code and set up and everything, it just makes it very easy uh, for you to handle your infrastructure. And it's really saving hours on us, on the development team, 
every single day for deployment uh, concerns. So that has definitely been affecting me overall. But you know, something like what ChatGPT is doing, uh, it's it's amazing to see how it's working so far. Nice. Yeah. Um, I guess either of y'all, um, wh whoever wants to go first, there. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. I was, I was thinking about this question you were talking about. I could probably talk for a couple of hours and have some really good <laughs> conversations with you guys about hangers and how we label them and how we get annotations to move around. But honestly, the first thing that came to me is, you know, we're a company that's uh, fairly new to this game. So this the, one of the biggest pieces of automation and standardization, as I'll keep bringing up, was how do we get everything to be the same type of information across the board? And that goes not just to what our field team is receiving as a finished product, but also to all of the PMs and PEs and superintendents that are touching the information, the BIM modelers, how they're touching the information, because you got to you got to create a process through all of this. And the automation is what is standardizing even the naming conventions or what those standard deliverables are and being able to teach a process and have that be completed the same way every time. Automation is touching that portion of it because you got to be able to teach all of these different teams to be able to do the same thing the same way every time as well. It's not always just about what is on that school sheet. It's the whole package of how it flows from you know, a set of permit drawings out to where it gets installed in the field. Totally agree there. Uh, one of the biggest issues that I had regarding spools, kind of the information is people were just taking ITM databases and not knowing how to properly follow the steps to get the structure and information over from database to database. And coming from a support world is just having to teach them that process, create those standards. OK, whenever you do this, we're going to go through step A, B and C so we don't lose this information anymore. So totally understand where you're going there with that. Uh, we, Travis, could have, about we could have this whole thing on <laughs> ITM databases right now. <laughs> yeah, we could. Uh, I, I was trying not to go into that too far, but yeah, yeah, exactly. If you, if you really want to nerd out about it and you and you haven't listened to the podcast, the Construction Dorks have had done, well, we've done at least three episodes on content. Um, but then two of them specifically, one with Andy Robbins from Autodesk and, and another one with, um, oh, crap. I, I, I'm completely forgetting his name. Um, Brad. Um, uh, working with, used to work with Applied doing uh, the Autodesk, the, yep. the ITM stuff. Um, so, uh, yeah, we can completely nerd out about that. <laughs> um, but uh, so, you know, into to I was thinking through my my personal experience with automation. You know, um, I come I come from the development world, and and I always look at you know so first so first, um, and we're we're you know we're further along in our dirt journey with with data and this kind of stuff. So I I focused in and on some of the KPIs and metrics that we're trying to do, um, and it, like anything else, it starts out as a manual process of pulling the data into a spreadsheet, throwing it into Power BI or some sort of analytics. So like okay, now we've got it. To, to Andrew's point, we've got it standardized, what we want to look at and everything like that. Now, how do we automate that? So we're doing a lot of that stuff now to try to figure out how we just automatically pull, pull the data and, and allow the reports to run instead of uh, having some sort of manual process of somebody downloading a CSV and pushing it over here. Um, uh, but me personally, um, one of the things that that's kind of happened in this in this role is I've started to I started to travel more. Uh, for work, and then as my kids have gotten older, they've gotten involved in more and more events. And um, my wife will tell you I'm pretty terrible at telling her what I have going on. So um, I've had to use I use Zapier um, just to merely to keep my two schedules in sync. So I don't <laughs> I don't book a trip when my daughter has an important softball game or something like that. Or um, conversely, what usually happens is um, I'll tell my I'll tell my wife. I'm going to Seattle tomorrow and she'd be like you you didn't tell me anything about this and so at least now it's on a calendar somewhere where she can go <laughs> in and peek in and look at it and if I forget to, to mention it to her I I so I have a new little one and everything and that that has been my exact pain is that I'm used to doing my own thing and now the wife's like nope we we have to keep this <laughs> schedule so yeah she she's kind of used the same thing just having 
having everything accessible quickly for us to see. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Uh, so I guess kind of we've talked about the automation. Nalman's kind of hinted it at the beginning there. But what sort of hurdles have, uh, Andrew, have you had for implementing that automation uh, at your industry or at your company? Yeah, I've found out a lot of things and like Travis alluded to and I've said, we're getting into more of the, hey, we're starting up a new process. We're building our own database. We're, we're teaching all of our project teams how to work with the deliverables and how that flows through. The complications that I've found that have have really triggered have been twofold. One is that what are we actually doing in the field and how are we standardizing that and, and then pushing that backwards into our modeling process? Hey, this is how we go and install hangers. We don't install them one spool at a time. We go and install all of our hangers on an entire floor at once, then come back and do the pipe. How do we look at a process of how we put hangers either listed by spool sheet or how do we do it as by an entire floor so this whole process driven automation uh, sometimes you want to go into it and build everything out on the front end and have it pushed to the field and i've really been learning a lot of that comes the other direction you know the, the field process drives your modeling process drives your deliverables process and the other thing that's happened with that is also when you go to teach this process to our project teams and you say, this is exactly how to do it, when you're the one that's receiving all that information and then having to push it through to our fab shop, to purchasing, you tend to see other things that come back. Hey, if I were only able to receive my information in this way, I wouldn't have to do X, Y, and Z to break up this one spreadsheet into four other spreadsheets and then get that information over to purchasing. So it's been this whole automation process has been fantastic and I'm learning a lot. It doesn't just come from one person, one chair, one kind of entity. It's it's really this group effort to get what you need for a smooth process. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more there. Um, coming from my end, um, I dealt a lot with the training aspect of those new to Revit and everything, um, those that are just now starting to model and being able to say, no, you can't just model whatever. You have to talk to those in the field. I don't think they realize that I can, I don't just get free reign. I have to listen to somebody else before placing all those items. Yeah. Uh, Travis, on your end, um, what hurdles are, have you been facing there? Um, so, you know, there's there's always several, a lot of the ones that, that Andrew mentioned. Um, the one that I will I'll kind of pick on here a little bit is um, not to throw BIM BIM solutions people under the bus or anything, but you know we've been we've been trying this stuff for a long time, and a lot of our details are actually been burnt a lot in the past, or you know different different auto placement tools of whatever. Um, one of the common grumbles I hear is, well, I got to go back and fix everything anyway. So um, it just it's just faster for me to dry it, draw it off the bat. So, you know, yeah. trying to overcome with come that with, you know, pointing out, you know, you know, various systems, various, you know, the iPhone, the things like that. It's like things get better with time. You know, maybe maybe four years ago when we tried that 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 auto placement of, of sleeves. Yeah, it wasn't great. Um, but it's been four years. Technology moves pretty fast. Um, you know, that's the that's the kind of stuff. The other, you know, the other stuff that we we battle um, because we've been doing fabrication for a long time is is people tend to you know, people tend to unfortunately largely focus on the negative sometimes. Um, so you could spend you could send three thousand spools to the field that were that were great except for three, and they'll only ever remember those three that were wrong. <laughs> Um, so we may put in all of these these digital tools. We we push you know digital cut lists directly to machines that automatically cut it. And and by God, if you don't go out to the shop or the field and people are still pulling tape measure, I'm like, it's it's exact. Like there is there is nothing more precise. But you know they've been burnt a couple of times. So you know trying to trying to fight that mindset of I still need to double check everything. Which I, I get at the beginning. You're going to want to double check to make sure the process is running fine. But at a certain point, you hope that. They can kind of let go of that and and just trust the system. Totally 100% agree there. And, and 
I guess that kind of goes into my kind of hurdles for implementing change or automation is the change. Um, people, they've been doing this for a long time and I want them to, okay, let's go into a more automated workflow and they see it very negatively. They're afraid that um, they might basically, okay, we're becoming way too efficient. We're going to lose lose our jobs. Like what's going on here? And to me, that, that first example I used for hangers, no, not at all. We're replacing it faster. We can accept more now. Mm-hmm. So let, let, let's try to start changing those mindsets of, okay, it is not something negative to automate, but it is positive, allowing you more free time to double check if you need to some of these cases. Um, the biggest hurdle, like I said, it is that mindset. Um, but also you're implementing these automation changes. It's also another hurdle is the time that it takes to teach them how to use some of these. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of people, whenever they hear automations, they just think, okay, what's the money cost for me? To me, it's not just the money, but also the time it takes to teach them some of the tools that a lot of people don't realize. Uh, You can't just have one training on a tool and expect it to be fine. If you do that, then later on down the road, you're going to end up running into issues here and there. So to me, it's changing mindsets and realizing time is also going to be an investment at first with the automations. Tommen, anything um, on your end? Yeah, uh, Derek, I, I completely agree with uh, with where you're coming from. Like training is not just a one time thing, but and needs to provide continuously and then continuously empathizing with the users that hey, did the tool actually make sense? Um, I guess the biggest hurdle that I face, I, I kind of brought it up earlier as well, is making the trade off whether to automate that particular workflow or not. Um, uh, you know, like sometimes it just might not make sense to do that automation, and then you know. Uh, as Travis said, people only remember the negative to, uh, negative things that happen. So you might have delivered 100 different automation tools for them, but two of them were not that useful and kind of increased their overall time compared to what that workflow time used to take. And they're just going to remember those two and not trust 98 other tools. So you know, that trade-off becomes very, very important. Mm-hmm. Um, um, yeah, I, I actually ran into something very similar to that whenever we had a, a little R&D summit. I was telling them, OK, we're going to start creating these tickets for all the support calls we get in. And they go, well, what What if it takes me two minutes to like track this information? I'm just like, OK, well, how long is it going to take you to solve it? They said one minute. I said, that's <laughs> that's that's fine. It's It's an extra minute to input right. the information. But think about it this way further down the line. You're not going to have to answer that because now we're getting analytics of data that we can then fix that process in the future. So it, it's kind of it's kind of just interesting seeing people worry about okay, this increases the time right now, but they don't look at the long picture for it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, I guess kind of we're we're talking about automations that we have right now. Um, we we're talking about how technology moves fast. What's some future automations that you see on the horizon that would that you're really looking forward to actually using for it to come forward and everything? Uh, now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you go first here on this one. Uh, sure. Um, I think there's gonna be a whole new sector of services starting being offered around data, where like, so if you think about Chat GPT, it's being trained on public data for now. So it has been trained on Quora data sets, Twitter data sets. Uh, there's going to be a time when Quora decides that, hey, I have these LLMs like ChatGPT learning from me. I should better, I better start uh, charging them rent for this data. Um, and I think that's going to be a business model that evolves, and then it's going to boil down to firms as well, even construction firms, where people are just curious as to, hey, what is the proprietary data a GC has or a sub has that can be used for better business decisions or just keeping the industry up to date as to what is going on overall. So I think there's going to be a, I'm looking forward to uh, be, uh, even uh, industries and companies that thought they would never create something like a data lake to actually start creating them so that they can make sense of their data and then see how innovations like ChatGPT can help them in their automation journey. Uh, so 
Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, Andrew, what about you? You have any anything that you've seen that you're looking forward to? Yeah, my uh, I've got a long list going, and and it's it is actually one of those things that we talk about internally. Is <laughs> when Travis was talking about the KPIs involved in the process. That could be anywhere from all right, we got a permit set, and we're gonna get our database together with what standard materials we're using to how we're installing something in the field. We go back and we look at the processes and we say, all right, where are the areas where we're spending the most amount of labor? Labor is the one thing that I think it's a word that hasn't come up yet, mm -hmm. but it is what we say time and time again, every single day. Everything is about labor right now. So we look at these processes and go, OK, we got it modeled in or we made all of our spool sheets and deliverables. OK, we got we went through the fab shop and we went through installation. Where are those areas where we're spending the most amount of labor? Those are the highest areas where I'm looking at. Where do we start to implement automation into those tasks? Where do we start to shrink some of those areas? Um, I, I see a big, I see a big one in the model creation and the QC of models and how we get that pipe into the model. We, a lot of times, not all the time, because it's construction. There's going to be areas that are we use the same sort of layout. We use the same sort of materials. How do we get some of those things that we were repeating in a model in with fabrication parts over and over and over again? There's there's going to be a leaps and bounds to getting pipe or bathroom groups or standard assemblies for fixture into models quicker that are the same thing when you do have standards. Thinking about that 90-10 rule of like 90% of the time it's this way. Okay, let's focus our extended labor on that 10% that might be different. Totally agree there. And you, you kind of touched on something that I, I was actually, I'm sure Nauman had it in the back of his head, as you mentioned the QC. Um, that's something that we have gotten so many requests on here in the past, I'd say month, that everybody's seen, okay, we really need a lot more quality check. Uh, tools and right now we're looking to develop those even further to where like you're saying we do it enough we should have a list of rules that we are able to very quickly check against in our models and that's something that we have a team that's slowly starting to develop some of those automations so clients us we can all use them at the same time to basically put in your rules and it will flag you that hey this this isn't what you're supposed to be using this fitting. Let's go over to another one. Um, so totally agree with you there. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll just go ahead and keep agreeing and and you know, maybe <laughs> there. It's like one of the things that we've been talking about lately, and and it was a big theme at the MEP Innovations Conference was was productization, standardization. Um, you know, how do we, you know, to Tanner's point, like yes, every building is unique, but there's certain parts that we do every single time. Um, and and how do we do that? How do we automate that or or augment that from from the BIM point all the way through the shop in the field? Um, and so so that's one that's i think that we could we could do a whole heck of a lot there i know there's companies out there that are attacking like auto routing and and not just generative design but like trying to 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 the to Naman's point and, and you guys' point about learning from previous models and 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 teaching that um but i'll i'll, I'll throw on a couple more that i think a lot about you know we've we've kind of beat up the chat gpt to death but i do think that <laughs> i do think that everybody's going to kind of have this virtual assistant um, whether it's a detailer has these you know these ai type tools to ask questions or or set off on little tasks you know someone like me who's who does uh you know has to do quite a bit of research and in, in kind of you know whether it's research and in, in figuring out what we're doing next or research and developing some sort of new process like some of those some of that stuff, it's not going to do it for me, but it can provide a bullet point list of things that I should probably, you know, look into more and and, and give suggestions to. Um, and then, um, you know, I'm going to give a, a plug out to uh, someone in Andrew's neighborhood, Ryan Hoggett, who works for UMC, University of Mechanical. He's always like, we need to keep our guys in the make money position. So that's either face down welding or on the work face. So um, kind of back to the virtual assistants, I, I, I see some probably going to be some tools where, you know, whether it's a, a cobot that's fetching materials, fetching um, uh, uh, tools, whatever it is to to keep, you know, to 
to not to to again get away some of this mundane stuff you know people walking back and forth to to supply or or whatever whatever it is like keep them engaged in 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 doing what they do best and providing value in in the process no i I'm, go ahead norman so, so so travis do you see like boston dynamic robots or tesla's optimus robots coming onto the field anytime soon to kind of get rid of those mundane jobs I, I don't, it depends on when you define soon. Um, but I do think, you know, I, I've been, I've been to a couple, I've been to robotics conferences as far as five or six years ago, where they were talking about this particular uh, task for a robot and it's not there yet. Um, we all know how wicked the environments are on, on a, on a job site, but it's, it is coming, um, you know, you know, you know, maybe now that the journeyman sends an apprentice back for whatever that they need, but mm -hmm. why not send spot? You know, mm -hmm. as long as they can keep, you know, keep working, um, send something else to go to go get whatever that they need. And do a backflip uh, off of the... <laughs> <That's right. laughs> right. right. I, I keep on seeing mm -hmm. that video pop up and all I can think is, yeah, we, we don't do backflips over there, but OK, <laughs> that works. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, now that I think about it, that video, that latest Watson Dynamics video was in a construction setting as well, right? They were doing some sort of wielding, and the guy was jumping from platforms to platforms. So hopefully soon, as Travis said, depends on definition of soon. <laughs> I, I think it's, I don't know, everybody's, it's either going to be sooner than people realize, or or it's going to be, you know, I, again, it depends on how you define soon. Like some people, it's going to be too soon. Some people, it's not going to be soon enough. So. <laughs> It's one of those cool things where I like looking back on how they could barely get those robots to work or, mm -hmm. or walk. And it's just like, wow, OK, yeah, even though to us it's been years and years overall looking at the grand scheme of things, how quickly right. that yeah. has come, like seeing two or three spots climb on top <laughs> of each other to put a Christmas tree ornament on. It's pretty amazing <laughs> to me. Right. Right. Um, so kind of talking about cool things in our field and everything. Um, how are you using automation to start to attract talent to your companies? Um, have you all tried doing that? Um, I would say that we don't use it, you know, specifically to attract other than to show off what our capabilities are. Cause I do think mm -hmm. that um, when you're doing job fairs or you're doing, doing interviews or, or what have you, or we do a lot of internships, um, Trying to trying to show them that um, you know maybe maybe construction has had a little bit of a PR problem in the past. Um, this is the new construction. This is the way we're doing things. Like you're not going to have to um, bash your head against the wall doing something over and over again. Or you know you know you know you're not not just swinging a hammer in the same old manner. Manner like we're trying to we're trying new things. We're trying to trying to make construction sexy again. You know whatever that is. So um, it. it it's not always like seen as a direct recruiting tool, but I do think that um, the younger generation, particularly, probably sees it as some as at least interesting to get them get them in the door. It, and I, I one thousand percent agree with that statement there. Um, it, it's why I left the family business because I was like, man, I I don't want to be sitting there outside working all day. I don't want to really get into construction. But as soon as I saw that friend starting to use technology with it, um, it it's it's exciting again. I, I like to use technology and we have that generation of iPad kids and everything. They're just always using it. So to me, we can show that, hey, we use technology in construction now. Like it's getting people excited about it. It's not just pouring concrete, hitting hammers and everything. Um, Andrew, have you been able to showcase any of the automations or anything that the standardizations on your end that have people excited there? Yeah, I, I'm more in lines with Travis where it it's hard to use it necessarily as a recruiting tool. Um, what we are finding that there are individuals who might have already even been in the industry or heard about it who then get excited about it. Hey, you guys are using Trimble on job sites to go shoot. Hey, I want to learn more about that. What can, what can I do? And I've seen more and more classes uh, at our local union talking about technology, talking about how job sites are evolving as a foreman, using Bluebeam, using email, using all of these things that that play into everything that we're talking about here. How do we get a spool sheet and get something fabbed and out to the field? Guys also need to be able to 
consume that information and use it in a positive way. Um, it's been challenging in some regards because there's also that uh, that group of people who aren't as forward with it or as used to it. So it's been some people in and some new some people out and some new people in. But uh, it's it's we're evolving with the times and that's kind of where we need to be. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and, and Nomin on your end, uh, coming from the pinnacle side, um, what have you seen there? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I agree with most uh, with the most of the points uh, raised here. Like it's it's not really a great way to attract people, but just a slightly different perspective on it. Like a lot of people I've spoken to who are not originally from construction, they have this. Uh, they think that it takes it's a long onboarding time to get into the industry. Like they'll spend three to five months before they can even be productive uh, and like offer value for the clients. And you know, as Travis was saying, like everyone will have a personal AI a personal assistant to kind of help them with their jobs that's going to be trained on that company's specific workflows. So, you know, what we've been kind of trying to do is like, hey, can we use our company data, just increase the onboarding time of new talent and then just kind of be upfront about it when during their interviews, if they express concerns that, hey, you know, you'll be feeling productive way longer than you think you would be because you'll be just learning way faster and on your own as well. Um, so just kind of a different way of looking at it. Um, um, I, I wanted to add one thing to that is in our pre notes, uh, I saw somebody write something about the difference between the experienced plumber versus the person that has the experience in Revit. And there's these two worlds. Yeah. <laughs> when we yeah. talked about automation, automation is going to help bridge that gap. And that right now is is also something that comes up on a daily basis around here. Mm -hmm. So that goes back, I think, two questions. <laughs> yeah, it, it, exactly. And that's kind of how whenever I went through training people, uh, I told them, I was like, you, you can have that more experienced person start setting up the rules of everything and explain it to that new person. And all the new trainee, intern, whatever they had to do is click the button and they should be able to see everything start being placed, hangers, whatever it may be. Just do a couple of quality checks, which even now we're talking about creating automations to do those quality checks for us. So um, it's it's really easy to have somebody mentor those new users so they know where to put the data and where it's coming from as well. Well, I think mm -hmm. that we all know that there's the labor shortage. So we're trying to figure out how do we do, how do we help our people do more with less or more with what they have now? So all of these tools, you know, yes, we we may be automating a process that used to take them 12 hours in a week, but now they, they can do so much more than they used to, right? Yeah, 100% agree. And I do feel people, like, I think people feel happy when they solve problems. And once this problem is solved, the happiness goes away. So, you know, if you can <laughs> increase the timeline of how quickly you can solve problems, and new people getting in the industry as well just feel valued and you're like okay i got this let's keep right. going they're, they're much happier solving a problem than they are moving one pdf from one system to another system right <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes 100 percent um i i guess kind of to end it off um with this i i guess i'll kind of say um how does automation, I guess we, we're kind of already touching on it, but how does automation help you onboard those new team members? Anybody else have any opinions on it? Just kind of helping transfer that knowledge, anything there? Yeah, I would just, you know, again, elaborate on the fact that when you do the automation, you have to create standards and it makes it, it does make it so much easier for people to to be onboarded because they're not, they're not learning the way this one detailer, this one PM likes to do things. They're learning the way that the that the company way to mm -hmm. do things. Um, and you know, we we may lose a little bit of value because you used to put the the new people on the mundane tasks, and it would they would kind of learn it was a cheap way to to get them involved. But now, to Naman's point, they're adding value much faster. Um, if we can automate some of those mundane tasks, they'll still learn the tasks or learn learn the result of the task. Um, but now they're they're you know, hopefully uh, making the leaps faster to actually being uh, highly productive versus just kind of detailing out spool sheets, which is, I think, is what everybody does with a new person. <laughs> exactly, exactly. 
instead of just reiterating everything that Travis just said, <laughs> adding one thing that's kind of a cool piece of information that I've been learning myself is what I'm taking out of these trainings, what I'm taking out of the standardizations and the process and how when you go through those and you're forced to go through those, you're also learning about your own internal process and how you can make your own internal process better because of it. Automation is also teaching us things about all the places that we do things different or what we ask of our our, our field teams and our project teams to do differently. So it's it's been a huge learning piece as well. We're, we're getting information back out of it. Awesome. So, and you know, like these automations show you metrics as well. Like, you know, when you go down that journey, so it becomes, you know, like, hey, I automated that process and, you know, hey, this shows that I should probably change it a little bit here so that I can tweak that metric. And yeah, I do agree. It's like a constant feedback loop. After you do something, you've got to review what you've done and yeah, you can do it better. It's that it's that retrospective after developing a new tool, everything in the development world. You had to go back, see how you can improve it for the next process getting feedback from the user, seeing how we can speed that up more and more and more. So totally agree there. Um, with all that being said, I do believe we've kind of reached the end of our question list here. So what I'm going to do is kind of open it up uh, for the users that are watching this live um, to go ahead and ask for some Q&A. So I'm going to put the big classic uh, QA symbol there uh, on the screen. So leave that for a little bit let people answer or ask questions that we'll kind of go through. Uh, and I'll take a little pause here. And hopefully they can edit that and extend it out a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, lastly, I'll kind of end with um, thank you, everybody, for joining uh, our BIM series on automation. If you'd like to know more, uh, visit us at PinnacleInfotech.com or uh, post. We are going to add a little QR code in there for you to scan as well. So thank you all very much and see you all next time. <laughs>